What up? T-Bob here. And Jake as well. And look at you. You done stumbled upon little OTB Saints, where we bring you all the latest black and gold coverage. Who are the Saints going to draft? Who's going to be their quarterback? What does the salary cap look like? All that information and more. Hope you enjoy it. Like, subscribe. Nick, what's going on, man? How are we feeling today? How's the new studio going? Uh, it's going all right. It's going all right. Doing good. Uh, how you guys doing? Uh, doing well. We're just talking a little bit of Saints OC here. And before we get into names, help me answer this. How complicated is it for the Saints trying to hire an OC with some of the very public drama that's gone down and with just the general temperature of Dennis Allen's seat heading into this year? Yeah, I, I don't really think it is at all. I, I, like, okay. I'm a little confused why this this talking point has gotten so many legs to it because like it's just like if you're a quarterback coach, first of all, you're probably making about three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars, and if you're a coordinator, you're probably making one, two, three, four, five million dollars. So just in that sense alone, I mean, I think it's a very um, logical step forward for you. And look, look at Ryan Nielsen. Like he he took a job in Atlanta. And that situation was kind of similar to this one in the sense of like the head coach could be on his last legs potentially if things don't go well. And then the head coach gets fired, the staff loses their jobs, and Ryan Nielsen immediately gets a job in Jacksonville as a defensive coordinator. So, mm. like, if you go to a situation and you do well, like, you, as a coordinator, you, you aren't judged on the, on the wins and losses. You aren't even necessarily judged on like the execution of the plays you're calling because I think the league is smart enough to look at it if, like, say you have a terrible quarterback. And I'm not saying Derek Carr is a terrible quarterback, but like if you go to a situation where the quarterback can't complete passes, but you're calling the right plays and guys are opening the ball is getting there, the league is smart enough to see that and be able to evaluate that uh, on that merit. So I, I just don't think it's going to be that difficult of a situation. Um, there's only 32 of these jobs, in, in, you know, in the world. Uh, if you get one, you're on a path to going forward. In worst case scenario, say you take the job, you don't prove what you need to prove in the year. You just doubled, tripled, quadrupled your salary, and you go back and you be a quarterbacks coach somewhere else next year, and you you got that on your resume, and you got a little bit more money in your pocket. So, you know, I I just don't see it as a difficult thing. And then you know the the coup de gras here is that if you uh, go with a defensive head coach, you actually get to call your own plays. And how many of those guys are there like in the league? Like eight, nine. Like so, if you do a good job calling plays, you've accelerated your path to being a head coach tenfold because you're actually doing the job and you aren't waiting now, you know, to get out of somebody's shadow so that you can call plays and, and show what you can do. So I, hmm. I think there's a lot Fair of benefits point. to this job. And, um, you know, I just don't think that the downsides exist that, that people talk about like now, like it isn't like Shane Waldron goes and picks the bears because that's, you know, a better situation. They got two top 10 picks and a quarterback. They're going to trade for another first round pick. So you got three of them or, you know, there, there's certain situations where say, Cincinnati's a, a great one. Brian Callahan's going to, to Tennessee. Now, if Dan Pitcher wants to call his own plays, he won't go back there. But if he if he likes the situation and you're just kind of judging it situation versus situation based on roster and everything, obviously you're going to pick the Bengals before the Saints. But, you know, there's, you're going to lose out on some of these – through some of these factors. But I don't think it's a situation where, like, no one wants to coach her. I, I think that's a, a crazy, crazy take. Um, Feels and, like the main you know, point I think they're going to be able to get some of DA's seat doesn't actually factor in that much. No, I mean, I, I guess it does, like, in some level. Like, if you're choosing between – if you're if you're Zach Robinson and you have uh, a situation where the coordinator left to be uh, a head coach and you're going to be able to call your own plays and, you know, they have the quarterback in the setup and they're going to be competing for, you know, Super Bowls or whatever versus the Saints, you're probably going to pick that other situation. But, like, you know, once you get those top jobs kind of filled out, like, and then everybody's kind of competing, like, Raiders versus Saints, like, I don't think Antonio Pierce versus D.A. like really, really factors into it that much. You're just kind of choosing the situation then at that point, you know, which roster do I like better, which one don't. And, and, you know, I don't think that because he has three years, you're picking that one because D.A. might be in his last one. Because, look, if you think you're good at your job, you're saving D.A.'s job anyhow. So, like, huh, if you think you're taking a job true. and you aren't getting a nine-win team to ten wins or keeping them at nine wins, you, you probably aren't the right guy. You probably don't have enough confidence in yourself to be a good play caller. So maybe that isn't the guy you want anyhow. So who are those candidates? You mentioned a couple of names and, and Zach Robinson, somebody that we broke down last week. Who are maybe still the candidates out there, Nick, that Saints fans can kind of look out for, maybe start to dive into those resumes? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned one, um, Robinson right, right off the top. Uh, 
um, Dan Pitcher's still in the mix. Like he, he's someone that he's going to get a second interview here. The uh, the the um, Bengals quarterbacks coach, Dan Fran's quarterback coach, Kafka. Is it Kafka? Like I think he's someone that that's on the list. Uh, Gerard Johnson. They, they interviewed from Houston. You know, I think the Gruden thing is still kind of circling out there a, a little bit, but. You know, there's a handful of people that there's still to talk to. Um, you know, I, I've heard that there's a couple still in the playoffs that, that they want to talk to when the playoffs um, clear up or, or you get that week, I, I believe, after the conference championship games where people could, uh, can do interviews. So, you know, I think there's still a, a few out there. But, you know, the thing that seems extremely, extremely obvious is they want someone from the uh, the McVay-Shanahan coaching tree. And you kind of go through and you you look at some of the stuff they're doing and um, – it's, it's crazy. I just did a story this week, just breaking down the Saints' tendencies based on personnel, and like their their doubles with multiple tight ends on the field. Like the Saints, they're running out of it like almost every single time. Like and then trips, they're passing out of it almost every single time, and they have these like crazy tells. And then you know I was breaking them down for the Rams, San Fran, Houston, and like it's it's you know the Rams' top passing personnel was their top running personnel as well, based on formation as well. So. It's like these tells you kind of get rid of. And then there's just like other stuff they do. It's like how they build their run game and everything. Like the the Rams, I, I believe, were like third in the league in six-man boxes running against them. And you go look at Alvin, and almost all of his runs were against seven or more guys in the box. When he actually got six men in the box, he averaged 4.5 yards per carry. Like if you can get him in a system where where you're getting space for him to, to get out there and you know start his runs, a little bit he can still be one of those guys that averages four and a half yards per carry it's 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 right there on tape but like you have to find a way to get to some of that stuff and you know it's just like it's, it's through the use of motion it's these it's not having tells in your personnel and you know it's just so many like little obvious things that they need to figure out how to do but i mean the, these trees like they they do it probably better than anyone and you see the, the success all around the league and i mean the mcveigh shanahan thing is like basically i think it's like 12 teams right now so I mean, that's the way the league – it's not even where the league's going. It's where the league's at. And, like, the Saints got to find a way to catch up. So, I, I kind of hope they hire one of these these guys that they're bringing in to interview, and it's, it's not the Gruden thing because, like, I, I just want to see something that's, you know, current. And I'm not saying Gruden can't be current, but yeah. I don't know if he necessarily is current. And I would like to kind of cut down on that, that curve a little bit and see, you know, just a, a whole entirely different system. Like, the Gruden thing would feel like kind of like tapping back into the Sean Payton thing but doing it slightly different. and. You know, outside of Sean, like, I, there's not a lot of evidence that this system, like, works great in the in the league. Like, Joe Lombardi couldn't carry it out. Pete Carmichael couldn't. Um, you know, it seems like you kind of need Sean. And, you know, there were times where in, in it hasn't gone Oakland, great in Denver Vegas. either. I mean, right? Yeah, like it Sean hasn't. Even? It hasn't. Um, not yet. Uh, and by yeah. the way, y'all, the, the article that Nick is referencing here is just a master class of why you need to sign up for New Orleans stuff football. I mean, the depth uh, put, in, put into – the research of this article in which you break down, like you said, the usage it tells of the New Orleans Saints, it just so clearly lays out how they've been kind of lagging behind. And yeah, look, McVay and Shanahan company, they changed the NFL meta. And now all the best teams are using that system. So you need someone that is from this uh, new school philosophy. And uh, yeah, I mean, to your point, dude, they, there's a lot of great weapons on this, uh, on this New Orleans Saints team right now. Um, you don't have a, favorite over the others do you like is there anybody in your research or you uh like do you have a dream candidate i kind of i mean the, the two for me out of the names that we know i mean it, it's zach robinson and dan pitcher and you know i i like robinson just because of the the proximity to mcbay and just mm -hmm. kind of some other people that were in that role how they went out and they succeeded but i mean i i'm just kind of going off of you know what you what you see in the league and like pitcher has had a, a lot of um a lot of attention over the last couple of years he actually I think he got two interviews in Tampa Bay and then Cincinnati paid him to, to stay. And I think he, he ended up ultimately staying. Um, I'm not sure if he got offered the job or not. It sounded like he, he kind of had the option and, and they paid him not just like not to explore it further. So, I mean, there's an example of a guy turning down a situation at some point, but that one was probably a smart one to uh, turn down. Like the, the Bucks were tearing down their roster last year at this time. We all thought they were going to be terrible. Um, they didn't have a quarterback and, you know, they kind of, kind of got it to work, but, yeah, I, I think for me, just based on what the names that we've heard out of the, you know, and they're kind of the, only the last one standing, but I think those were the two that I always liked the best for him. I mean, because there's a little bit of that, like, unknown with them, too. Like, Shane Waldron, like you had seen, and you kind of knew what the upside was. And, I, you know, I thought he did a good job in Seattle, but I don't know. I guess it's kind of like the whole little <clears throat> draft pick thing. You know, it's like everything's perfect until you see the flaws. So 
I think it's just a little bit of that, that like on loan and being able to like unwrap it and figure out what it's going to be makes it kind of exciting. But um, I think those are the two guys for me based on the names that we've heard. Nick, uh, we didn't get to talk to you. I'm trying to think about how time's weird. I'm trying to think about when all the Loomis stuff went down, the, you know, Gumgate uh, 24. <laughs> I don't think we got to speak with you on that, right? That was... It was after no, you was came after. on. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. I'm just double checking. Uh, That's right, because he said like something might happen that day, and it was later that day. Yeah. What was your, and not of the gum chewing. The gum chewing is what it is. I don't, like, whatever. Uh, what was your interpretation of Loomis's pitch on why there should be patience for DA? Uh, from where I sit, I look, I think it's like, I think there is a logical argument to be made for bringing him back. I don't think that was it. I think that, again, showed a clear misunderstanding of how his fan base currently feels. You're talking about the milk card? Yes. Him him, so cocky, like he had some sort of ace of spades and he'd been hiding up his sleeve, like, you activated my trap card. I'm about to compare Dennis Allen to the greatest coach of the vote time. When really, as an adult, I would have just appreciated, like, look, I understand why people are upset, but, you know, we look around at franchises like Carolina or others, you don't have to name them, right, that that go through coaches, and that's not a sustainable model for success. And we believe we've seen that briefly. Like, I feel like you just could have handled it easier without invoking the names of Walsh and Landry and Belichick and, like, all the best coaches in NFL history. My, my favorite thing about that is he gave you three years of records for all them coaches, and then he only gave you two for Bill Walsh because he went 13 and three in his third season. Yeah, that's, so, what, I mean, that's I was... what Taylor said too. Uh, when we, because he, he, yeah, he broke down all the numbers for us. Uh, so, I mean, what was your interpretation of it? I mean, I would have, I, I would have I, I liked it a lot more if he just said, "Hey, look, like we brought him back. We're going to win the games. We're going to prove you all wrong. And if we don't, we got to eat it." And yeah. I mean, like, just say that. Just say yes. that. I mean. Yeah. I just kind of felt like the presentation was a little bit rough. And then, you know, the, the obvious thing that everybody else was saying, you know, he, he gives you Belichick's um, Browns records, but, he, you know, DA first three years were not good in Oakland. So, like, no. I don't understand why, why you're, you're moving the goalposts on that stuff. But, like, <laughs> yeah, just come out and say, like, hey, hey, like, this is our guy. Like, we believe in him. You guys are all wrong. You don't know what's going on. You're a bunch of idiots, and we're, and we're going to prove it to you. And, like, all right, cool. Like, I would I, I would have – thought that was a better way to kind of go about it um you know i just i i don't know i don't know why that one had to happen like that i think it was kind of a, a little bit of a rough look but look i think the messaging kind of all year has been a little bit rough just from from all parties um within the organization like every now and then there's just like something i said and it's like man like you guys should workshop this a little bit more like it's just yeah it's just public kind of relations have a, have a beat appear to be a bit a bit uh, odd right there was this the comment about selling the tickets um, oh, I know there's a third one that I'm missing as well. Yeah, I don't know. It, 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 and I, I guess what kind of becomes upsetting to me, Nick, is it feels like, from my view, it all comes from a place of hubris. Where yeah. if you oh, had he, he someone... He came out there like, you can do nothing about me. I am untouchable kind yeah, of energy for yeah. me. Yeah, it's, it's like the wrong presence. Like, they need, I don't know if they need someone more in touch in the PR department. Or maybe, but, but that's why I say it comes from a place of hubris. It just looks like they don't care about the PR, right? Yeah. Look, I, I, I think the States have a really good PR staff. I think those guys go out there and they prepare them and they tell them the stuff they need to say. And I think sometimes people just say what they want to say. So, like, I, I can't put that on the PR staff. Mm. Like, I, I think they do. I think they do a great job. I think they're really in touch with the fan base. I, I think, you know, but like, you know, for me, like, what, what I was kind of like referencing is it's just kind of like, like DA going up there and being, you know, back, back in cars so heavily all the time, but like not necessarily backing everybody else the same way. Like that's kind of the stuff I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, you know, and look, like if Mickey's going to go out there and say something, Mickey's going to go out there and say something. Like you can't, you can't police every single comment. So like I, I can't, I, I think that, I think they have a tremendous PR staff. I can't put that stuff okay. on them. But I mean, there's a handful of times like, you know, it's just, it's just, I think maybe I think maybe sometimes when people are up there talking and they're freestyling, like they aren't as aware of the temperature of like Twitter, you know, is, is maybe That's fair. people in the PR staff can be and you can't you know, if you're talking for an hour, like you can't you can't be in control of every single comment as a PR staff. So um but yeah, I mean look, so I, I just I just think a couple of things that Mickey said were just a little bit like, man, all right, but ultimately they gotta go out there and win these games. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, if they do that they are going to shut everybody up. And then that note card is going to look a little bit, but like, it's just in the moment, it's just like, come on, man. Like just, just say like, this is our guy and we're backing him, and just kind of keep it simple. Yeah. It's a great part about football. That's why if you're in these positions, don't complain, just win.
And if you win, we'll all shut up. We'll eat yep. crow, and yeah. you'll be, and everybody will be in love with Would you. Would love to tell you that I was wrong. Yeah, like you're you you win in the end if you win. Nick Underhill, New Orleans Love Football is a site. Go sign up today. Again, I'm a proud subscriber for probably coming up in like four or five, I guess like since it started. How long is it, Nick? Has it been four years almost now? It'll be uh, four years on uh, Valentine's Day. Wow. Early congrats, man. Uh, yeah, got brand new studios over there as well. Him, Trip, Brooke, the whole squad doing excellent work. Uh, and follow him on Twitter at Nick underscore under L. Wow, just amazing black and gold takes right there, Jake. I don't think I've ever heard any takes that are better than the two guys that just gave you that take. And you can keep getting them by going ahead and liking, subscribing, ringing the bell to get notifications when we post. Have a great day. We'll see you on the next OTB Say.